Thank you. Welcome, welcome. So um, this is a presentation, but ultimately we're all number one to have a dialogue. So um, the whole point here is to provoke and to hopefully create um, narrative and uh, collaboration. Yeah, and fun. And fun, and have fun. Speaking of fun, so this is Eva and I. Um, I'll go first, I guess. So Michael Hammond, I'm the design industrial design director here. Um, thank you, Steve. <laughs> and uh, I know Steve well back there. Um, and the Trek team. I've worked at Trek for 14 years prior to Design Concepts, where I work a lot on visual brand language or with the team back there. Um, I. What else? You said you were going to have a master's degree. I was going to say that I have a honorary degree in just being awesome. That was one thing I came up with. Um, and my passion project right now is uh, just having a team that I hopefully can enable to do really awesome work. How about you? Well, Eva? I have a lot of passion projects. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he gives me two controls. What, what do you expect? So um, I am the general manager from San Francisco. I am an industrial designer by training of a master's in design. Um, started out in automotive and advanced concepts at Chrysler, then ended up going into toy design and innovation. So if anyone wants to geek out over Star Wars, I probably know more about it than anyone here in the room. Um, which I don't know, well, maybe that might be fighting words with Mark. Um, <laughs> And then a career in innovation. And I actually geek out over user generated images and the power of images. So if you guys want to have a talk, of, you know, talk to me about that, I'd love to tell you about um, how flawed I think keywords are and um, that we need to get to inside people's brains to really understand what they're thinking about. So. Those are actually your feet, right? Those are my feet. I have a shoe problem, which. Um, I'm, I'm in a 12-step program. There we go. BBL is dead. But before we go down this path, let's make sure we are all on the same starting point and understanding what BBL is. So, does everyone here know what the acronym stands for? Okay. Who right. doesn't? Anyone? You can admit it. You can admit it. Friendly crown. We're friendly. Visual, oh, Briar, thank you very much. I'm not to explain it. Visual brand language. And as Dave mentioned, we've done a lot of great visual brand language projects here. Um, Limited laboratory systems. Um, you know, the visual language is a way of strategically setting up the way your, your company communicates its core values and personality through product. Sense. Here's another example of how it manifests itself across the entire system. Um, another example we have um, with Mizuho, and it's a unified system that reflects the intrinsic qualities and voice of your brand, and it's an alphabet of design elements. Thank you. And all of these combine and result in a, creating an emotional connection, an honest emotional connection um, between the brand and the consumer and the users. And, and it's that connection that, that makes it evocative and adds value to your brand. So with all of the great things about VBL, and the fact is, as a designer, I love VBL. I mean, getting a VBL project is like the best thing ever, right? You, you know, it comes down and we're like fighting. It's like cats and dogs to be able to get onto that project. But after all that, if designers love VBL, why? Why kill it? What do you think? Because. Yeah, it is because. It is because it's limited. And it's because that it's irrelevant in, in today's experience, culture. And we're going to prove it. So we're going to take it. 
Thank you. All right. So, we want to take a minute. We have a few props in the room. We have more props coming. And we're going to play a game called Name That Brand. Now, I got to tell you, this is an easy game. And everyone in the world, that's a big clue, by the way, will be able to name that brand. The question is just going to be, how quickly can you name the brand? Now, if you know, I'm going to ask you guys to all hold it until the end of the presentation. Don't be a spoiler alert and let us know. Okay, and we're going to do this by breaking it down sense by sense. So we're talking about sensory brand language. So we've got sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell. And we have little cues. We're going to take you through this brand and have you experience it literally one isolated sense at a time. And we're going to start with sound. So everyone close their eyes, listen to the sound, and tell me if you know what this is. Next, we're going to do touch. So you see that there's boxes around the room. Put your hand in the box, touch the object in the box, feel it, experience it. <laughs> Pass it from person to person, experience the object in the box. Okay. Does everyone have a chance to experience? Yeah. All right. So next we're going to go to a little harder one. We may not be quite ready yet. So let's just talk about what this is. So, a sense of touch. So, did it feel, what are some words that come to mind when you think about the object that you just touched? Is it cold, warm? What, what, how would you describe that? So, anyone have any words or, or descriptors? Familiar. Familiar, that's great. Swarpy. Swarpy? Swarpy. Swarpy. I like that. Shapely. Shapely. Smooth. Smooth. It's another great word. Fur. Fur. All great words. How are we doing? Next, we're going to go to sight. So there's going to be a few cues here. So this is where we're just using our, our eyes. We're looking at a color. Does this color say anything to you? No, no, this is <laughs> Maybe over there, a little better color. There's a little different. Look over there, that's a better. And you're kind of imagine you can you can mix them together and create a new color in the middle. And that's probably a little more accurate. That's okay. Cause... And then there's a mark. There's a form. All right, now this is pretty easy. So many people may, may be gelling, maybe gelling. And then next we have people who are going to be passing around um, things to taste. So I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes. Right now, close your eyes. Design Comp is going to bring along, there you go. This is a blind taste test. How are they supposed to grab it? <laughs> Point of fact, don't close your eyes until we've given you some. Okay, give us a new hand. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Jay. And then, but before you taste, don't taste anything yet until you, the first sip, I want you to plug your nose. All right? Plug your nose so you can't smell anything, and then I want you to taste. <laughs> Take one sip, closing your nose, and taste, and think about what it tastes like. So after everyone's had a sip, we'll move on. So, does anyone know why I asked you guys to close your nose? So, I mean, the reality is, 
when we are tasting something, depending upon which research you report you look at, 65 to 95 percent of the flavor cues we get are actually from our sense of smell. So if we can't smell something, it tastes different. So now, you guys, without closing your nose, take a, take a sip and experience it. Does it taste different when you have your nose closed, plugged, before we can smell it? Were there any of those flavor notes? When you're thinking about what you taste on your tongue, those are kind of our five flavor senses there, what it is. And now it's time to take a smell. So just kind of get in there like it's a great glass of wine, swirl it around, get the bouquet up on the glass. This is a very fine beverage, by the way. <laughs> And, you know, sense of smell is really interesting. It's actually one of our primal senses. It was the first one that we evolved as, not only as humans, but as just beings on this planet. So even bacteria have a sense of smell. So it's one of our most rudimentary smells. And it's because of that that it's actually the one that is the most evocative of the memories. So the reality is, is what we smell brings back more episodal memories than any other sense we have, more than our sense of sight, taste, or anything else. So it's hardwired actually, and, and the olfactory bulb is right by the, the hypothalamus of our brain, and that's what actually creates those memory patterns. So it's, um, we are literally genetically engineered to recall memories based on our scent. That's why scent is one of the sensory cues that is most provocative. Um, and one of the really big cues with multi-sensory brain design. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you guys realize that you know, marketers have been doing this for the last 10 years. You walk into a store, they're piping custom scent in that store. So, Nordstrom smells different than that Hollister, that smells different than Gap, that smells different than Victoria's Secret. Um, Mr. Mercedes smells different than you know, all the luxury brands have developed, of car brands have developed their own custom scent that um, defines who they are. Um, and that's being those are being developed by design features. So multi-sensory design and the evolution of all these scents are, it's not high in the sky, it's actually what's happening right now and, and what we've all been experiencing, whether we know it or not. So the five senses. Um, Okay, everyone, can you tell me what it is? Coke. Very good. It is. And, and Coke has been around for since 1982. I mean, so they have an advantage, right, being almost 125 1892, years. 1892, I think. Or 1892, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and being around for over 125 years. And, and a lot of the sensory cues and the hard wiring of our memories to this brand have been done organically. But they've also been crafting this brand. And I want to take a little bit of reason why. So actually, this is a phenomenal thing. There's a billion Coca-Colas for me yesterday. That's how pervasive Coke is in this culture. It is the most iconic brand in the world. By the way, Michael and I have a bet that if any of us says Apple, we owe each other a dollar today. You just did. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I owe a dollar. So sound. This is actually, I'm going to share with you guys a sound that actually was created by, by Coca-Cola and Dolby that they think communicates what their brand stands for. epic than the first sound we shared with you that's been engineered, designed, and created to represent, represent the brand. They call it the epic brand of Coke. And the voice of Coke, so Coke is actually really 
engaged in what it stands for. Also, they play all the time in this realm of the multi, of the multicultural, the global aspect of COVID. So this is one of their recent grant initiatives where um, it, it, it's, it's really celebrating all the dialects in Sweden. So if you go up and you say Coke in the right dialect, it'll actually dispense your Coke. So it's a competition. And if you think that Coke is an engineer in every experience, Braxton O'Neill is the voice of corporate Coca-Cola. If you call up Coca-Cola, you're going to hear Braxton. Thank you for calling Coca-Cola. One moment, we'll be with you shortly. My name is Braxton O'Neill, and I'm the voice of Coca-Cola. Whenever you call into any of our consumer-facing numbers, I'm the voice that you hear greeting you online. I think my technique has gotten a little better over the years. I, I try to convey a very welcoming tone uh, that makes sure people feel like they're in a friendly and family-oriented environment here at Coca-Cola when they call in. There is literally not a touch point in Coke from the voice of the corporate entity to anything else that we experience that has not been designed, engineered, and incorporated. And it's not, it's purposeful. And the touch of Coke, the bottle, the iconic bottle that we all felt, you know, um, the first contra this bottle right here, was developed in 1950. It's the first, it's been trademarked in 1960. The original Coke bottle was actually inspired by the, the lines, those grooves of the bottle, were inspired by the Coca pot, which is one of the key ingredients of it. And, but actually one of the first prototypal, prototypical uh, bottles was actually inspired by the Great Urn. And that's it right there. It was before the other one. Well, thank God that that didn't happen. It's not quite the same. But um, unfortunately, industrial sliders had to get involved because that couldn't make it down the production line and it was a little tippy. So it didn't work. So they had to redesign it and create this form that we know so well. And if you look at the bottle semantics of that bottle, there's a reason why we fall in love with it. And actually, Coca Cola bottle is so iconic that it's memorable even in the dark. And, and people all over the world can recognize that symbol and that form in the dark. They don't need to know that it's Coke. They just do by the feel. So, site Coca Cola, the red, it's not a PMS number, it's Coke, it's registered, it's a registered trademark. That is Coca Cola red. It's not defined by the PMS number. And the market code is pervasive and recognizable not only in this, but in every language. So no matter what language you have, when you see that brand, you know what brand it is. And that icon, if I show you that at the first slide, you guys would all know what that is, right? And that's recognized in the world over. And the taste. So what do you guys taste? Flavors would tell you that these are the four flavors that are iconic, that are part of the Coke. So, Vanilla, cinnamon, orange, and lemon. Interesting. But, is there Coke in it? That's the question we all want to know, right? And I can say that they import between 50 and 500, what is it, kilos? Is that what I said? Kilos of Coke leaves every year, which are then processed so that there's absolutely no Coke in it but are still incorporated in their formulation. And what's amazing is, do you know what company that Coke is sent to? Melon Crop, where it's turned into a pharmaceutical cocaine and used in, specifically here as a drug medicine um, in the US. So it's pretty amazing. So Coke, or the coca leaf, is still part of the secret formula of Coke. And speaking of secret formula, one of the, the most celebrated and reported and, and, and dissected bad business decisions ever was made in 1985, Five. thank you, where they decided that they would change their formula because research told them to. Consumers like sweet things. So they decided, you know, the trend is that consumers like sweeter best beverages, Pepsi is getting, you know, their their, their market share is growing, maybe we should rethink our formula. So think about that. How, how confident do you have to be in your decision that you say, I'm gonna take a formula that is 100 years old and just mix it up a little bit. We're just gonna change it up, we're gonna go with the new formula, which they did. And if you know what happened, it was so bad made the cover of Time, it was the kind of Time cover, and then they went and had to go back three months later and change. 
But the one thing is the man who actually did this decision said it was one of the most important decisions Cook ever made. Because it proved, them, proved to them that they would be willing to do, number one, do better research, understand who you're talking to, and understand what your brand stands for, but also prove that Coke as a company was willing to do everything and to understand also the need to understand everything more. So now, if they do with more blood, you know it's never going to be a new Coke. So I was thinking a new Coke is never going to be a great Coke. And then the scent. The scent of Coke is so iconic, it's actually a perfume. So if you know anything about perfumes, they actually look at formulation, they talk about tones and notes, you know, so there's amber, or there's rose, and now there's coke. So if you like the scent of coke, perfumers actually engineer the scents, the perfumes, with coke as one of the, the key um, scent notes to it. So coke as this example is this perfect example of multi-sensory design, and they spend millions of dollars every year to do it. And they continue to do it now, so you can think about the new way of enabling you to create the ultimate product, right? So now I can create any product I want and brand it up. And Coke has now moved beyond just their branding is such that they're so iconic they don't even need a product. It's not the beverage you're drinking, it is the feeling. So taste the feeling. It's not taste the product, taste the beverage, it's refreshing, it's taste the feeling. And what does that mean? So could there be going on beyond just tangible, multi-sensory design to actually tapping into your emotions? So they decided that it transcends product into emotions, which is where storytelling comes, you know, masters of storytelling, right? So, and this is also all about, so it's really getting into the realm of experience design, where we're not just designing products, we're designing experiences and how we engage. And it started not back in, that last campaign was, back in 1982, but started this is one of the classic campaigns, right? Where it's like, I don't know if I'm a product, I'm fine, it's feeling, it's feeling, it's sharing. So what are they doing now? How are they doing, you know, design in a rich visual world? They got AR, yeah, they did a couple years ago, before anyone else, so, you know, you get your cell phone out, and these little characters popped out, and they had little couple things. They played around with your stuff off of your phone. In augmented reality. They did this for New Year's. So you could gift a New Year's experience, a Coca-Cola experience to your friends. And that's it. Now, now it's virtual product design. So I don't even have to drink Coke. I can create a virtual Coke and send it to people. I can send it to people all over the world and it'll even pop up on billboards. So it's like a transcendent product to virtual experience, which I can share with someone across the world. So this example is just kind of to kind of get you guys thinking about how we engage in brands, how we engage in multi-sensory aspects of all brands, how it can transcend even being a product to where you can actually have a brand that just is feeling. It's just an emotion and it still has value to us. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. It's, it's confusing. I don't like Okay, so we'll change it up a little bit here. But I think what's interesting is that Coke's had 125 years to figure this stuff out. And they've been catering to those senses over that time and just building their brand and their multi-sensory language. And they've been doing that organically. Is that the right way? There we go. Well, you know, 20 years after Coke started, Ford started. And they've been around for 100 years now. But if you think about it, it's only been in the past 10 or so years that Ford's brand and business model have gone through some serious change, some massive change. And like every brand today, they're being driven by new technology and new consumer demand, which is also being driven by technology. They've had to rethink everything about their brand language it's forced them to think about multi-sensory design. It's not about just the car anymore. It's not even about that new car smell. It's about Ford smell, Ford sound, what they feel like in a retail space, how does their app interact with you, all those things that they gotta think about now. And you've likely heard this quote a hundred times, and I wonder what Mr. Ford would say if he wrote this today. 
I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses with voice command navigation, hands-free riding, sensual artisan-crafted touch points, empathetic moon-enhancing sense, the ability to order a pizza from the road, and of course, a deeper, more consistent emotional connection with the horse's brain. <coughs> it sounds a little ridiculous, but that's the world we're in now. We're in this world of an experience-driven economy. And whether Mr. Ford knew about this ahead of time or not, we're in it now. And all of us designers for brands new or old have to find a way not just to survive in it, but flourish in it. And so there's, there's more channels, there's more choice, things are moving faster, they're getting more confusing, and there's, there's all these brands beating on us. There's just so many visual signals that they're still using. It's the same old stuff. It's not enough for a brand to just be visually available anymore. They have to be ever-present, they have to be there at the right time, at the right place, in the right amount, and they only, it all needs to be consistent and reliable. So, you know, consumers are, you know, thanks to Coke and other brands, consumers expect this from all brands now, and they want to be able to control their experience, which has a whole other level of complexity. And the thing is, <laughs> brands don't have 125 years to figure it out anymore. They're lucky if they get 1.25 seconds of your time to engage you and create an advocate out of you. So this is all very daunting, I think. Um, and when we're talking about death and killing and just kind of piling onto it, this is getting to be a really, really heavy topic. Um, but the good thing is that we're all starting to make sense of it as designers. You're seeing this stuff. We're here and you're here to start this conversation to think bigger about brand, to think bigger about design and brand language, and how to bring multi-sensory design into our toolbox more often and more effectively. So let's circle back to this brand language thing. If you remember listening to a story around a campfire, it stirs up feelings of warmth and summer fun, and that's pretty awesome. What's cool about it is a great storyteller can really capture our imagination and our emotions. And they can tap into our senses by just using words alone. And those words are on a structure. Great stories have a structure. They have a narrative arc that puts the story into a certain order so that it makes sense and that it's more compelling and more dramatic. And brand language really isn't that much different. There are all these signals to organize, and now we're talking about sending different mes messages to the senses at the right time in the right place. So this is where I get really excited because if you consider designers to be storytellers, I do, and this book is really awesome by the way, um, designers too need a narrative to structure their design work so that all those signals hit at that right time in the right amount and they're all consistent with representing the brand values that, that they're trying to represent. So we could start calling this a holistic brand language that right combination of brand and multi-sensory signals and a really powerful narrative. So here's your brain on visual brand language. But when we're talking about holistic brand language, we expect it to light up more of the brain. We want to light up more of the brain. Maybe not all of it at the same time, but definitely more of it. So when you think about all those interactions you have in a day where you're listening, smelling, tasting, touching, and of course seeing, it is holistically how we interact with the world around us. And we've been doing that for thousands of years and we don't just see the world with our eyes. So that's where visual brand language really isn't enough to contain all that multi-sensory design offers. Holistic brand language contains more dimensions and all of this can amplify your ability to take in information. Hold on. So when you can take in more information or give the person more information, you can make a more positive imprint, something that's gonna last. And this is something we expect if we're gonna start trying to build a holistic brand language. Does anybody remember these markers? Oh. Mr. Sketch markers. They didn't start out smelling good. They started out smelling pretty bad and they figured it out. They said, we're making all these colored markers. Let's make them awesome. Let's add some cool smells to them. And they've stuck with me for 30 plus years. Um, they took something that wasn't great to use and they flipped the paradigm. They thought about how they could bring coloring 
and scent together and make it a whole new experience. And now they have a whole web experience with sound effects and mixing your own colors and smells, although you can't smell it on the internet. Um, still pretty cool stuff. And here's a newer example. I think I could probably talk about Nintendo all day because they are masters at making an imprint. Uh, a lot of us has grown, have grown up with Nintendo since 1985 and they've been continuously trying to push past the controller and the screen, which are core to their brand. They always are taking their brand experience to new places. And here's Nintendo's Labo, or Labo, depending on where you're from and what you want to call it. Um, it's their latest thing. So there's these simple cardboard kits that you have to construct, and you hook them up with the switch, and you create this whole new experience outside of the screen. You can have fun and feeling while you're feeling like a musician or a robot and doing all the motions and interactions. You can maybe be a fisherman and do, you know, feel all the haptics of that. All of this is, you're doing all this while it's remaining very consistent to the Nintendo brand. That's pretty cool. So, the thinking of making an imprint, while sight might dominate the way we take in information, it's really not the best at making that imprint. Uh, when digging into, this, digging into this a little bit, I found two separate sets of statistics. I almost said that right. Um, so, you can see that we put a ton of emphasis on the, the site, right? But it's really not necessarily what sticks with us, like smell does. So what this tells me is, one, we're probably too focused on site, and secondly, we should make everything smell really <laughs> awesome, right? And I personally would probably choose bacon and coffee, maybe at different points during the day. <laughs> so thinking in terms of holistic brand language it can help us make our brand and our design work more accessible. Here's an icon, the Honeywell thermostat, and it's the Nest that sprang directly from this. It's an icon reborn, but Nest's emphasis on usability is really what moved them to, to build the design language that you know, includes haptic feedback and voice commands and sound and graphic interface elements. And being that they were one of the first IoT you know, mainstream products, at least the one I can remember, um, they learned to adjust for the senses really quickly. They didn't start out with the best product. And with consumer feedback loops, they evolved their product by focusing on consumer interactions with other senses. And since then, they've woven themselves into the home into a connected system. Smoke alarms, cameras, doorbells. Nest is aiming to be the language of your home, which is a pretty big deal. I don't want it in my home, actually, because I like to keep the internet out of my house. So um, all, of, all of their products and services are designed for accessibility, and they can reach a larger range of users, young, old, blind, deaf. Everybody can use it. Um, and while all these products you see here really kind of nail the elements of v, a good, consistent VBL, the real magic in using them is through voice and touch, where you feel and hear the product and the product Nest brand experience. You don't even have to really see it anymore. Harley-Davidson. Let's see where this goes. Um, so who's ridden a Harley? Anyone in here? Okay, a few of you. Not me. Never have. And I think for those of us who haven't, it's pretty easy to imagine what it's like. I mean, you can imagine the engine noise, the vibration, the sheer terror of accelerating out of a corner way too fast, all while you're inhaling the smell of oil and, of course, leather. Um, but it evokes, evokes something in us that you know, really makes us feel kind of like a badass when you think about it. And I wonder, you know, what happens when you take those away? Is it no longer Harley? Is it no longer a visceral experience? Um, how are they going to answer that with their new electric bike? I think they're probably thinking about that. And it's really interesting to think about how your holistic brand language could shift like that. You know, what, it was, you know, what is holistic brand language now in an electric world for them? And maintaining that visceral experience. So I think using holistic brand language, we can expect it to help our brand be more dynamic and our design to be more dynamic. We've been focused on static visual representations of brands for so long. We fall in love with the image. We fall in love with the object. Um, we know people aren't static. They're always moving through time and through different environments. And that's what changes our perception and our mood even. And when we're thinking about a design, designing experience 
holistically, we have to be aware of design's effect on the senses. Because it's constantly changing. And it changes depending on when and where it's applied. So if you think about a typical customer journey map, these usually capture a small snapshot of the really big overall experience. But there's so many interactions, even here, that happen with your product and your brand. How do you make a brand language that's flexible enough to fit into all these different situations? How might you leverage the different senses at different points in time or different places to heighten and or lower their emotions? When we think about social media or even artificial intelligence now, taking a, dy a dynamic approach can also mean that the brand and their brand language are influencing the user as much as the user influences the brand. So it creates this weird symbiotic new relationship, part of this experience economy, uh, which I don't fully understand, but it's awesome. So, not unlike visual brand language, we can expect holistic brand language to communicate and reinforce your brand's values and your brand's value proposition. The difference here is that you can get past many of the limitations of visual brand language or in a visual only engagement. It's really wide open. Whereas you had to be visually present as a brand and maybe possibly get in the way into facing your value, think pop-up ads or constant commercials, that sort of thing, where you're like, get out of my way. Um, now you can send subtle messages and deliver delight at thoughtful points of interaction to remind people how awesome your brand is and how awesome you are. So over time, brands have become complex systems. This web made up of social media interactions, apps, physical products, retail environments, virtual products. These all need to be stitched together in a clear and consistent way. Designing an experience that uses multiple senses over all of these different channels gets really complicated. And the idea of holistic brand language is that it can start to pull together and put some order to all of this complexity and help focus a multidisciplinary design team so that they can nail the experience they're intending to design. So in the not too distant past, Visual brand language is the realm of industrial designers and visual designers. And we thought that visual brand language, we thought about visual brand language in terms of the foundational element that you see here. There's a few missing, probably typography and those kinds of things go up here as well. But these are all still very relevant. We still very much need these. But now we're dealing with sensory design. And there's a lot more dimensions to that. We start to see that we need more levers to pull. And we're going to need more people involved to pull them. So, you can see what's happened in the last 20 or so years to kind of the design field. The number of participating, to, you know, people participating in design, all the different disciplines, went from that to this. So there's plenty of horsepower here. And where visual brand language was, like I said, the realm of industrial design, visual design, building a holistic brand language is really everybody's business. And you can see it in a lot of companies where a lot more people are getting involved in design, right or wrong. Um, each of these disciplines can bring something unique to the table, a different point of view. And you know, there's even more different disciplines that we haven't even thought of or haven't even been invented yet. That's what's pretty interesting. But if you imagine you're trying to get this many stakeholders, this many people participating in design to agree on something, yeah, good luck. Um, and we recognize that very few places would have a team this deep, you know, unless you're Nintendo or Ford or Coke or maybe the, the A word. Um, <laughs> I won the bet. Um, the size of the team, it's not the size of the team that really matters. It's, it's kind of the willingness to think more critically, more deeply about your whole brand experience together. I really want to see brand people and marketing people and design people Stop working apart from each other. It's just they're always in these usual silos. And um, because if you're going to work toward building a holistic brand language that's supposed to be your beacon for an experience design, you've got to be thinking about strategy, along, you know, design strategy along with your brand strategy. Those things are now together, these aren't separate anymore. And if we consider this model here um, from another great book called uh, The Physics of Brand. 
you know, this model in creating brand value, holistic brand language can be really foundational. You see it right there. It's about focusing on designing the signals that touch the senses at the right moments, to create the right moments. And you can do this the old way by prioritizing the usual visual signals, but then you'd only be thinking in these dimensions. And you'd be leaving a lot of the brain inactive and leaving your customers wondering why they didn't have a more visceral experience. So yeah, visual brand language is dead. Holistic brand language lives. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more. What's next here? So, before I hand it off to Eva, there's been an internal dialogue, and that's how we got started in, in, in front of you guys today. There's been this internal dialogue here, and we're taking steps to figure out how to deal with what's next in brand language, and how to build a design language that's relative and re relevant in a multi-sensory world. Um, and we're starting to put a frame together, framework together around this. And you've got to ask, you know, what is, what is holistic brand language made up of at its core? And of course, you're going to have brand values. You've got to know who you are, what you represent, and how to communicate that outwardly. You've got to have design principles. You've got to have these design elements. But now we're thinking about signals to senses and emotions. And then you've got this new dimension of time, place, and I would consider a mountain there as well. So there's a lot of new stuff here. And like all design projects, this is going to be an iterative process. Right now, we're all here. We're here to think about these elements that we can use as a foundation. Um, and Ava's going to take us through these. Eva, Ava, I was calling you Eva. Okay, let's go. It's my German roots. So, you guys with us so far? Keep following the narrative, right? So, it's pretty interesting, right? So, I want to share a quick story before I get started, just about why I think we have to really reframe how we think. So I'm talking to Michael, and tell me about the kids, what's up? And he's saying, oh yeah, my son is seven. He's like, yeah, it's so cute, he comes home. How many of you have kids? How young, you know, right? And do they play on the iPad? How many of them play on the iPad, right? So it's, somebody was like, yeah, my son's seven, he's on his iPad, he's playing Minecraft. And I'm like, okay, well that seems pretty advanced. Okay, well, you know, it's your parental choice. You wanna let your kid play Minecraft? Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not judging, I'm not judging. But then he says, I look down and he is talking to the iPad and he says he realizes that he is coding new content for Minecraft on the iPad using voice. And why is he using voice? Because he's seven and he can't write and he doesn't know how to spell. So he's got a user interface that's allowing him to create an entirely new Minecraft experience on his iPad using his voice because he can't spell and he can't write he's seven years old. Those are the experiences, and that's why, that's kind of in a, in a nutshell, why visual brand language, as we know, we're no longer experiencing products in that way. It is limited. And so we're like, we're like, and, and this is, number one, this is up to debate. This is Michael and I saying, we feel stifled by what we have. We as designers, and as a group of designers, as, a, as practitioners, we need to start having this dialogue and talk about if I want to start designing, thinking about VR, AR, voice, what's my voice? How am I interacting with Siri, Alexa, and everything else? How is that respect responding in my product? We need to start thinking about it. So we created these five, what we consider foundational components of a holistic brand language, which we're defining as color, structure, voice, elements, and tone. So what does that mean? So color we think of as kind of, you know, involving emotion, values, light, hue, character. So it's beyond just what we think of color, but color in personality, color in brand, color in your brand voice. So it's kind of about hue and tonality, not only in form and in hue, but in how we're interacting with our brand and the emotion. So, Here's an example, this is a great product, which actually came out of a San Francisco office by this designer, Matt Batman, who's a superstar, by the way. So, um, and this is kind of, we went to start thinking about it, how it's manifested in products. So, this is actually the proximal lens of a medical device. And you can see here, what's the most impactful thing? What does your eye go to? Your eye goes to that red, that red interface, 
right? Which not only is the brand color of Penumbra, which is the manufacturer of this, but red is evocative of action, is evocative of, of critical control. It, there's emotion connected with that choice of color and hue and why it's on that control. If that entire thing was red, it would be inappropriate, right? It wouldn't be, it, it's not reflective of the character of this product, but it is appropriate and evocative when it's used in that way. And structure, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is the two-sided the two -sided one is not advancing. So structure, we're thinking about structure, some of the, the kind of the components of structure, we think of form, line, materials, shape, Structure would be where you'd start thinking of where your RTBs might be, your benefits, and if you're looking at claims, and benefits would be within the structure of how you can start marketing or looking at the structure of your brand, the structure of your product. The language, this is where kind of the phonology, the, ling the linguistics, the syntax, the rule systems reside kind of in this area of structure when we're thinking about a holistic brand language. And then voice. You know, many of you, if you're in marketing, you understand what we think about the terminology of brand voice. So voice is not only like the, literally the voice, like the Coke voice of what's the voice of Coke, but the voice of how you're communicating. So what's the essence, the tenor, the line, the proportion, the brand voice, and the content or the semantics of my brand is what we're saying manifests itself in this kind of new area of voice. And balance. So the balance not only of, in the case of my example of talking about Michael and his son, of how I'm interacting with my, my product in a virtual, physical, digital world, so there's a balance of what kind of interaction I'm having, what proportion of that interaction is. Is it almost 90%? If I'm on my Harley, that's like 90% of that. But there's still digital, you know, there's other virtual kind of interactions going on in my Harley. But, you know, in the case of Minecraft, not so much. I mean, I can play Minecraft, Minecraft a product on multiple platforms, on my computer, on my iPad, on my phone. So, so, so is it the physical aspect of Minecraft? Or is it all digital, right? It's all digital. Yeah. So, like digital so there, there's that balance there. And that's a proportion, harmony, contrast, kind of the sensory balance. And this would also be kind of where if you think about a gender, like if your, your brand were to, to to go along the spectrum. This is where it would fit, at least in our mind, when we're starting to think about these frameworks, where that might be. And then finally, we look at tone. So tone being kind of resonating in this area, personality, sound, haptics, tenor, texture. This is where strength and, and kind of the use and pragmatics fit within this area of tone. So I know we're throwing a lot of stuff out here with you guys. But we've been really, and you know, being out in San Francisco and and and, and realizing that the physical product so many times, it's not, it's about the fact, the reality is, is that you are going to interact with this product in, you know, all different planes and all different dimensions. And the think that we're designing product just along this almost two, three-dimensional plane and that that's the structure and the, the, the system that we've developed seems inadequate for where we as designers are being asked to participate. And even if you as a brand are not there yet, you're like saying, you know, I'm not doing voice yet. The reality is, is in two or three or four years, you will be. And we wanted to come up with a framework that as your, brain, your brand evolves, you will have the tools, you'll already have broken this out, so then you can leverage it and you can apply it to the many different dimensions you have across all of these different formats. So, we're not saying it's right, we're not saying it's wrong, but we wanted to start a dialogue with our design colleagues and say, are you guys experiencing the same tensions? You know, do you think we need to rethink this? And what do you think? Do we kill BBL tonight and say, you know, it's the birth of holistic brand language, or do we want to hold on to the old? Is it adequate? Does it help us do what we do? Is it enough? And I guess that's the challenge. Thanks, guys. Hopefully we got you thinking. Um,
I um, love to, to have to continue a dialogue. So, you know, our contact information is on our website. They love to, you know, continue and evolve this and get feedback from everyone because we, we really think there's, as, as practitioners, we should be thinking about this and pushing, pushing the boundaries and, and, and pushing our field um, and making us think outside our baby elbows. Thanks, everybody.